All right, so we're going to be talking about um, electrical diagrams and circuit tracing, which what, what I'm going to try to do is connect together how we use diagrams and schematics in real life, um, go over some different types of diagrams and schematics, and then uh, show some images that kind of, you know, show how you translate, because I think that's where a lot of text gets stuck is, you know, they can look at a schematic and they can understand some of it. They can look at what's on the equipment and understand some of it, but it's taking the schematic and translating it to the equipment or the equipment and translating it to the schematic. And so we are going to, uh, we're going to cover that. So as we go, any questions, ask um, uh, apprentices, you can ask in chat, or you can also unmute yourself and ask. I encourage that um, because we got two hours here. That's a lot of time to, to cover this. For those of you who are on the live stream. It is two hours, um, but we want a lot of interaction, which will help us um, help us come up with some uh, content that'll be helpful to you. So here we go. All right, first off, there's several different types of um, schematics or diagrams that you're going to run into. In fact, in different segments of the industry, it gets kind of um, confusing when you even say schematic or diagram like when I, I i asked my brother if he would come on and join us which he hasn't yet but um when you say uh, schematic um that could mean or, or even a diagram that could mean anything from shop drawings um it wouldn't necessarily always be electrical um, but when we're talking about schematics and diagrams these are going to be the most common types the first is going to be the ladder schematic um, which is the one that's probably best for uh, actually tracing circuits. And we'll go over that. That's sort of the traditional um, schematic. The point-to-point -point or connection diagram, that's actually becoming the most popular type that you're going to see on a lot of HVAC equipment. Um, it has a lot more detail in it. Uh, it's also going to kind of show where the connection points are in real life. Uh, it's not a truly representative picture, so it still shows things like um, symbols uh, to represent things, but it tries to um, make the connections a little bit easier and also a little more realistic because on the ladder diagram, it shows how it connects electrically, but it doesn't necessarily show you how it looks when it's connected. Um, and then the pictorial diagram, or uh, I think that's how you say that, pictorial um, diagram is more of a, of a picture. It actually looks like what the components look like. So on a point to point or connection, it might look it's kind of like what the components look like, but it's generally still going to use symbols with pictorial. You're going to actually have pictures that look like the uh, the thing you're connecting. So we'll show examples of that. Um, you're also going to have things like shop drawings um, that often fall into the, um, the term schematics or diagrams, which generally aren't specifically electrical. These are going to be things that um, kind of go along with plans and specs on jobs or, you know, pictures of equipment that go along with uh, product data or installation instructions, that sort of thing. And then you're also going to have, which it could be any of these, you're going to have as built. And there's a, there's a difference between um, a lot of the ladder and point to point diagrams that you're going to see in the field and true as built. And we're going to talk about that, how often um, a factory is going to give you a diagram that includes every possible option. Um, but a lot of that stuff's not actually going to be there where an as built is going to give you exactly as it was built, not something that's a, you know, a theoretical, how it could be built. It's much more specific. So a lot of times um, you run into uh, diagrams or, or, uh, or schematics that have all kinds of stuff in there that doesn't apply. And really the first thing that you're going to do is figure out what is really there and what isn't. Um, and so if you have an as built that, that saves you a lot of, a lot of heartache, but most cases we don't have that um, on the topic while we're talking about as built, because um, this doesn't happen as often as it could as built can be drawn in the field. So if you, for example, you make a field modification to a system or you add in an accessory, um, you can actually draw your own, uh, your own schematic or your own uh, connection diagram in order to illustrate how it actually is. And that's really handy, especially if you're doing anything that's, you know, especially abnormal or especially strange. I know Eric Melly always, always does that, um, tries to find, uh, I don't know why I said tries to find. He 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 takes time to um to go through and, and actually redraw schematics wherever applicable. If he's made a made a significant change. 
Uh, one of the questions is how long do these run? Um, they vary. Uh, last week's was an hour. It really just depends on what my schedule allows. Uh, the, the last one on Tuesday. These go on Tuesdays and Thursdays. This one is going to be two hours from six to eight. All right. I show this one here, uh, this really basic ladder schematic, because it is so basic. And it just gives you a sense of a couple really common symbols that you're going to see. Um, and in a ladder schematic, we're connecting circuits between uh, one side and the other side. In this case, it's L1 and L2. Um, so in this, because it's 120 volts, that's going to be what we would typically call hot and neutral. Um, if it was 24 volts, it could just be between what we, you know, we call hot and common. It really doesn't matter what we call it. We're going from one side of the circuit to the other. Now, because this is a step-down transformer, step-down from 480 volts AC to 120 volts AC, you can see that we have more wraps on this side of the transformer and fewer on the other side. This is the iron core. So this then becomes our circuit between L1 and L2. This is our power supply here. It goes through here. We've got a fuse. Then it goes through a switch. We have a, uh, a coil in this case, which is you can see this M1 uh, marking ties together with this M1. And you're going to see this a lot. You're going to see it in many cases where you have an electromagnetic coil or some sort of control that has the same symbol as the thing it's controlling. Now, often they're going to be separated. So, uh, you know, everything that's going to be on the 40 volt side is going to be up here. And here we're showing that it's using an 120 volt coil to energize an 120 volt motor. But in many cases, the coil or whatever you're using to turn something on and off is going to be on the opposite side of the circuit. So maybe the motor would be up here on the 40 volt side and the contact that controls the motor would be up here. But when we energize this coil, it then closes this switch. So let's let's uh, talk through some um, some standard infrastructure for a circuit. You first have to have obviously power supply. Um, in this case, we have a fuse. You don't have to have that, but you generally are going to have some sort of fuser breaker. You've got a switch. This is what we call a single pole, single throw switch. Uh, the easiest way to think of the pole is the pole is actually the, the part that moves. There's only one of these, and it only throws in one direction. So there's not another throw up here. So it only goes on or off. Then we have our load here, which this is going to be our control load. So this control load is controlling this switch. So when we flip this toggle, it makes a circuit from one side to the other, which energizes this coil, closes this switch. So what it would look like is if you took a, uh, a line and you slashed through it like that, that would be a symbol for closing a switch. Now this is showing its normal position. So this is a normally open contact. A contact is just a type of switch um, that's controlled from somewhere else. So it's a contact that then closes and then energizes the motor. Somebody here uh, brings up, uh, is talking about high voltage and low voltage series in parallel. Almost everything that we work on is parallel circuits. Um, we, we can connect switches in series with each other. So we could have a switch and a switch and a switch and a switch, but we're almost never going to put more than one load, which is the part that actually does work, whether it's electromagnetic, which is what we call inductive, or whether it creates heat or light, which is what we call resistive. So both of these are actually electromagnets. This is an electromagnetic coil that causes this contact to close, similar to a relay or a contactor. And this is a motor, and motors are basically electromagnets, rotating electromagnets. So these are both inductive loads wired in to parallel circuits. So these are not series. Um, very rarely are we going to use series circuits in, in much of what we do. It's not in electronics. You're going to see some series circuits, but in, in general, um, a series circuit is referring specifically to loads in series, not switches in series. So a lot of people will say, you know, daisy chain switches together, like in a safety circuit. That may be a series of switches, but that is not a series circuit. A series circuit is when you have more than one load in the same path in between L1 and L2, if that makes sense. So yeah, somebody else is commenting safeties are series. Again, that's a series of switches. That's not a series circuit. When people say a series circuit, they're talking about loads in series. And this just goes back to, I mean, again, a lot of these terms are confusing and redundant and all that. But if you, you know, go to the basics of electricity and they say a series circuit, they're not talking about a series of switches. They're talking about loads connected one, you know, into one and out of the other. That would be like your old school um, 
uh, Christmas lights, you know, where one blows out and they all, they, they all stop working. We almost never have that. We're, anytime we have a load, it's going to be on its own circuit and may have multiple switches to control it, but there's going to be only one load per path. And I keep restating that because it is, it is an area where a lot of people um, get very confused. So another thing here uh, to, because again, we're just talking about the different types of um, diagrams and schematics before we actually go into specifics. So if, if this is really boring to you, uh, hold on, we're going to actually look at some real life examples, but I want to set the stage here. Um, so in the case of a ladder schematic, there, none of this actually represents where the connections really are. I mean, these could be done on terminal blocks. These could be done on jumpers. These could be, you know, all kinds of different things uh, that are making these connections. And you really, uh, this picture doesn't tell you what the components look like. It doesn't tell you how they're connected. Um, there's really nothing here that's telling you how it actually looks in real life. It's just telling you how it's wired, right? So, I mean, this could be a connection at a wire knot. It could be at a con, you know, a, a lug, you know, you just don't know. It could be on a board. We don't know. The ladder schematic doesn't tell us. The ladder schematic just tells us how it's wired so that we can understand how the circuits are laid out. And it makes it easy for us to kind of get a sense of what the circuit does, what it controls, how to trace it, how to diagnose it. Um, to some degree, but when you're going to get really specific, you know, this isn't showing us the color of this wire. It's not showing us where it's landed, any of those sorts of things. So that's the challenge with a ladder schematic. But the nice thing is it's very clean and clear and you can easily figure out, okay, this is one circuit. This is another circuit and figure out what each one does. If you have any questions about that, as we go, feel free to, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Students, raise your hands um, online. Feel free to ask any questions that you may have or comments. All right, so now we have a point-to-point -point diagram. We're actually going to go over this specific diagram a little further on, and these are much more common nowadays. Um, you can call them point-to-point. -point, you can call it a connection diagram. Um, different manufacturers call them different things. Different books call them different things, but this is typically what you're going to see nowadays, and you're going to notice this isn't laid out with a clear L1 and L2 on either side. It's really just showing you each conductor and where it goes, essentially. Now, you can figure out you know, again, we have our, our L1 and L2 coming in here from the power company. And so we can kind of trace it out, but it isn't this clear from one side through to the other. If I wanted to try to figure out everything that was in this compressor circuit, for example, I'd have to, I'd have to look through and, and trace back. Okay. This is going through to my plus one pole on my contactor. Okay. That's going to L1. My start is going to Herm on my capacitor. You, you follow what I'm saying. So in terms of figuring out where things go in real life, these are very nice. These point-to-point -point or connection diagrams, um, they're going to have a lot more detail. So they're generally going to tell you things like, you know, what's optional and not optional. Um, it's going to tell you the colors of the different wires. Sometimes, especially in a larger commercial ones, there's going to be all kinds of numbers all over it that allow you to kind of reference, um, you know, the a, a number marker on that particular conductor or wire. Um, so those are those are some of the advantages here, but they are a little more challenging to kind of figure out how everything is wired because it takes a lot of you know traveling all over the all over the picture in order to figure out your circuits. And then we have our pictorial, and and this is just an example of a pictorial um, that I grabbed um, that actually shows you know the motor looks like a motor, the overload looks like an overload, a contactor, a transformer looks like a transformer, switch fuses, all that. And then over here, we've got a ladder schematic. So it kind of, these two relate to each other. Um, and actually this isn't really even a true ladder schematic because you've got, I mean, it is a form of a ladder schematic, but it's not going, you know, a, a ladder across. Um, and so the pictorials are nice. We don't get a lot of those because it's very difficult to draw super complicated circuitry with drawing a picture for everything. Uh, but sometimes with simpler things, uh, we will have pictorials and that's very nice because it not only gives you the connections, uh, but instead of using symbols, we're actually drawing the components the way that they actually look. That's what makes a pictorial a pictorial is that you're drawing the components how they actually look. So it assists with identification of the components. So that's a, that's a key element of, uh, of pictorial. All right. So now, and I'm going to move some things on my screen so that way I can access everything here. Um, now we're going to go over some individual circuits. Let me see if I can zoom here. Yeah, I can. Okay. And um, this is a 
a very basic single phase ream unit i'm releasing a video on uh, sunday about this unit just kind of going through the individual components but i want to show you um, how you would do this and th this is you know almost about as simple as it gets in terms of a residential air conditioning system but there's some things that create some overwhelm for newer techs when they get um you know they, when they first start using schematics uh and i want to try to help eliminate some of those challenges so the first thing is is that when you're looking at this picture, some people will kind of take this and this and put them together, but these are actually two schematics of the same thing. And a lot of manufacturers are doing this nowadays where they're um, giving you a, a ladder schematic, a, a true wiring schematic type, and that's what this is. And then they're also giving you the diagram, which is more of a point-to-point -point or a connection diagram. But you see, they're just calling this a diagram and they're calling this a schematic. So not all manufacturers use the same language. And if you look in your book, um, it's going to uh, it's going to talk about um, this being a point to point or a connection diagram and this being a ladder. But here they don't say that. They just say schematic and wiring diagram. Uh, Jessica's sporting her blue on hat. She she went over to the dark side. It's good to good to see that, Jessica. Um, so here's where I would always suggest starting when you're looking at a, at a diagram like this or a schematic like this. Start by, and, and again, this is, this is true of a lot, of, uh, a, a lot more of your residential type equipment. Um, if you're just trying to get a sense of what you've, what you've got, first identify what is optional and what is standard. And there's a lot of things on this that are optional. So let's go through and just, just pick those out. So here we have a start relay. So this is your potential relay. You can see here, it says OPT, optional. Now, how do I know it's a start relay? Because it says SR. If I don't know what something is, I go down here to the component code. You can call that the legend or the key. Go down and see what it says. So zoom in here a little bit. It's not the best, uh, not the best picture, but SR stands for start relay. Now, it doesn't say what type of start relay, but we know it's, a, it's got 521 listed on it. And that is a potential relay. We also have this SC that's optional. Well, what is, that? what is our SC? You can probably guess, but that is a start capacitor, also optional. So when we look in this unit, we have to identify, does it have this start relay? Does it have this start capacitor? Um, in this case, this unit doesn't. These are uh, options for the unit. So oh, they're, they're not there. Um, we're going to go over to some of our safeties. Oh, well, actually, let's, let's first do our crankcase heater. So we've got CCH, which is crankcase heater, crankcase heater, optional. CHC, crankcase thermostat, or crankcase, crankcase heater control, I should say, optional. HGS, hot gas sensor, optional. LPC, low pressure control, optional. LAC, I mean, you're getting the point here, but... If you were trying to pay attention to all this stuff and tracing it out, you would find really quickly that it's just going to gum up the works because you're looking for all this optional stuff that's not there. So make sure that you uh, know what is there and what isn't there. Even this TB is optional. Well, what's a TB? A TB is a terminal block, which means that there's a good chance this terminal block ain't going to be there. <laughs> that's really going to confuse you if you're expecting to see a terminal block and then it's not there. Because what do we have here? We've got these. We've got these wires and it, these reference back to notes here. So this one here goes to note number five. To thermostat sub base, refer to system schematics or schematics for indoor section for low voltage control wiring. So it's saying this is field installed. Low voltage circuit to be NEC class, whatever, you know, so it gives you these little references for each one of these, but these are field wired. This is your um, Y and your brown that, that's coming from the field that you're going to connect. Here, we've got dashed lines. Dashed lines, it's going to tell you what dashed lines are. Factory standard is a solid line. Factory option is dash dot dash. And then field installed is dashed. So these are field installed right here. And these are your high voltage conductors. These are factory options. We got our ground here, we got our L1 and L2. And here it's going to even show you that on 
uh, on your yellow and your brown, those are also field installed. I, I wish that these, these really should be dash two because these are field installed. These are your low voltage conductors um, that are coming in from your, in this case, they're, they're feeding from your air handler, but they're ultimately coming from your thermostat. So why is your Y circuit powering your contactor? Brown is your common. If you don't know what these mean, well, sure enough, it's got a wire color code too. Yellow, white, red, purple, orange, black, brown, blue, green, gray, right? So you see the first places I'm starting if I want to understand a piece of equipment. A lot of stuff here down at the bottom in your legend or your key, looking at your notes, getting used to your components, identifying your components, color codes, what the different symbols mean, what the different um, you know, wiring, dashes, dots, solid, all that, what that all means getting a sense of that. Now, the, a lot of this stuff is pretty universal. So once you get used to it on one, it's going to be the same on many others, but it isn't always going to be the same. Another thing here that's interesting about this diagram that you're not always going to see is it actually shows wire nuts, things that need to be wire nutted together. And so there's going to be a wire nut between this factory wire and then this factory option wire that's going to go to your CC, your compressor contactor. Here's the next thing I want to show. You're going to notice that here it tells you where things are optional. Over here, it doesn't. It doesn't show you what's optional over here. Now, it's got some numbers still, so you can kind of identify some of your connection points. But for example, if you look at your uh, outdoor fan motor, just as an example here, you're going to notice it doesn't tell you colors. It doesn't tell you common start and run. It doesn't tell you much of anything. So you know that one of the terminals on the outdoor fan motor has to connect to F or fan on the run capacitor, but you don't even know which one over here. It doesn't have as much detail. Now it's much cleaner, so it's easier to trace your circuits through, but it lacks a lot of the detail. If we wanted to know more about this, we would have to go over to our outdoor fan motor, and then we would see, okay, there's a black wire that goes through here and then ends up going back to T1. Now, even this is interesting because what happens if you don't have all of this additional factory stuff? So you don't have your LAC, your low ambient control. Well, in that case, then this black wire is going to nix all of this, and it's just going to go straight from here to the top of your compressor contactor. Now, that's kind of annoying because it doesn't really, like, you, you, have, to, you have to figure that out. Like, it's not, it's not obvious. It doesn't tell you that. But because these are all optional, just imagine that these are all deleted. What do you have left? Well, you have this black wire. If it can't go to this because it's optional, well, then where is it going to go? Well, it's going to go where it ended up, which is up here on T1, top side of your contactor, right? Which is, in fact, where it is on this unit. So a lot of the stuff that makes these complicated is that these are not as-built drawings. So back to what we are talking about before. And as-built would be this is exactly how this unit is in real life. But because the manufacturer has to draw one, and it has to cover a wide range of factory options. They've got all this additional stuff in here that you have to delete out in order to make sense of what you actually have in the field. So you have to know what you got and what you don't got, which means that you actually have to start by looking at the equipment because there's nothing on there that's going to tell you what is in that or not. We'll use the example of the crankcase heater. If you don't know what a crankcase heater looks like, then you're not going to know if it has this CCH option. So a big part of being able to um, read schematics, the big part of being able to trace circuits is component identification. Because if you see, again, CCH, you're going to assume, oh, well, you know, where is the circuit? Well, you're looking for a crankcase heater. You're looking for a belly band, right? You're looking for, uh, you know, one of those insertion type um, crankcase heaters. If you don't have that, then you say, okay, this was a factory option that doesn't exist. Delete can't find any of those. Those options aren't going to exist, right? Make sense? Let's take a look if we have any questions. Um, Performance HVACR says you can usually see most of the components when you open the control panel. Um, that is often the case, but sometimes it's not. And, and again, it depends on what we're talking about here. So this is a residential unit. So yeah, you, you can easily see everything you know, by looking down at the top and looking in your control panel. Pretty straightforward. But if this were a commercial unit that had multiple panels in it, uh, then it's going to be a little more difficult. You're going to have to go through everything, and there's so much there 
that this is where a lot of people get overwhelmed. So I'm just kind of starting with uh, some of the things that I like to begin with. So that way you, you're not so distracted. Again, what components do you have? You know, no one kind of, kind of looking at all the stuff in your legend or key. Eliminating all of the factory options that you don't have. So you're not looking at those. And now you can begin to look at one circuit at a time. Because when you're diagnosing, you're always going to be focusing on one circuit at a time. So let's say we have an issue with our, um, I don't know, we, let's say we have an issue with our compressor, for example. So we can go over here to our more basic diagram, and we're going to look at what's in the compressor circuit. This is a nice place to start because it's kind of it's kind of stripped down, right? So we can see that we've got our compressor contactor. Now, this is your typical single pole or what they call a one plus contactor. It's got one contact in between L, you know, this, this says L3 and T3, um, and then L1 and T1. But this is literally just a hunk of metal, right? So our common for our compressor is connected straight to the line. Now, if we want to look at our note, if we want to be real thorough, which we should be, up here, it has three. So let's just see if there's anything. Connected field wiring and grounded rain tight conduit to fuse disconnect. All right. You know, not, not, not real specific to what we're talking about here, but it's got a, you know, so that would be something to check. Comes through, goes to our common. Okay. In order to make the circuit, in order to get to the other side, though, we've got these two other circuits. Let's start with run. So that's R goes over to our other side and connects to our T3. Now, where does it connect? Well, it's showing just sort of like middle of the ladder. If I want to know exactly where it connected, then I would have to go over here. I can see, all right, R, trace that down. Okay, that does connect directly to the T3. But see, again, you wouldn't know that because this doesn't show that it's connecting directly to T3. It just shows like here, that could be a wire nut for all I know, right? Because this diagram isn't concerned with specifically how it's connected. It's concerned with electrically how it's connected because electrically everything that's along this line is the same, right? Electrically, there shouldn't be any significant resistance. So these should all be the identical point, but only when you come over here and you pay attention to where it's connecting, do you know exactly where that point is, which is why they call it a connection diagram or a point to point, point to point connection to connection. And then in addition, we know, okay, this is going to be a red wire. But starting over here, it's kind of nice because it's a little simpler, right? So we see that this CC contact is what's going to open or close to energize or de-energize this compressor. That's pretty clear. That's the only thing that's in the way of running this compressor is this CC contact. Now, we're all bright enough and we've seen enough systems that we already know this, right? It's a compressor contactor. And so some of you are like, okay, Brian, this is boring. Why are you telling me this? Because this is the basics on which you build in order to understand much more complicated schematics and diagrams. And this is what the mistake that I think a lot of techs make. I'm going to just wax, uh, I guess not poetic, but something <laughs> for a second. Um, techs jump into complicated schematics and diagrams because they don't need schematics or diagrams on simpler units. You can see it all, you know all the components, so why do you need a schematic, right? And so you're not used to looking at them, but then you end up on the big Munters unit or the big Aeon unit or, you know, the humidimizer or whatever you're working on that's weird. And now you start trying to read this big complicated schematic and you get overwhelmed. The key to not be overwhelmed is to understand everything that's in them, eliminate what's not there, and then focus in one circuit at a time based on what's happening. So if we were having a compressor issue, this is where I would start, just understanding everything. Then we go over here, we say, okay, we got our start terminal. Now, where does that connect? Well, if I didn't know better, I would look and say, well, it goes up here to the two terminal between my start relay uh, and my uh, start capacitor. Well, because here it doesn't say that it's optional, but I, if, I, if I paid attention to that, I'd be like, nope, this is all mixed. This is out. So this doesn't exist. This wire doesn't exist. Forget this. I've just got this and then it go, this wire here and it goes to H or Herm on my RC, which is my run capacitor, right? Let's go over here. Now I can actually see a little bit more information. It is a purple wire that goes from S to the Herm terminal on my run capacitor. So 
have a compressor problem, might want to check my run capacitor. Where am I going to look, right? Run capacitor, compressor contactor. Those are the two things I want to, I want to pay attention to. Is my switch closed or is it open? Is my capacitor open or is it, is it measuring the proper uh, microfarads? So these are things we already know because we have this memorized. But say you didn't know much about it, but you knew how to read a diagram and you had a compressor problem, you would know these are the things external to the compressor that can affect those circuits. Make sense? Any questions so far? Uh, okay, uh, so a couple other things. So if we look here, we got our LAC. What's our LAC? Go over here, low ambient cooling control. Now, something I want to focus on real quick because this doesn't explain what symbols mean. You got to know some basic symbols. And we've done this a lot in the class already, but I want to go through now and take a look at some of these symbols and some of these switches. And the, the picture isn't real good here, but they often aren't. <laughs> they often are kind of small and hard to see. So LAC, this is basically a fan cycling switch is what it is, but it's a single pull, single throw, open on fall pressure switch. This little bell looks like a little bell. That is a symbol for a pressure switch. There's only a couple symbols that show up all the time in air conditioning and refrigeration. And once you know them, actually it's pretty simple. So this is a pressure switch. And that means that it's going to remain closed as long as the pressure is high enough. And that's exactly how a low ambient control or a fan cycling switch works, right? If our pressure is high enough, then the fan is going to stay on. If our pressure drops, our condensing temperature drops, our condensing pressure drops, then that's going to shut off our outdoor fan motor. It's gonna break the circuit to our outdoor fan motor and it's gonna shut it off, right? Now, again, if we didn't know any better, we would think, well, where is this thing? And you're looking all over for it. You know, okay, I know it should have that. Nope, not necessarily, because it says right here, it's optional, right? And you're not actually gonna have that in most cases. Very rare we're gonna see that, especially in Florida. Let's take a look at this switch right here. Oh, actually, yeah, let's go up and look at this switch right here. What is this? <clears throat> Crankcase heater control, CHC, we already talked about that. All right, one of the students, tell me what type of switch this is. Somebody, somebody un unmute yourself and tell me what type of switch this is based on what we've already talked about. I'm going to put you on the spot now. Thermal. It's thermal. Yeah, you can, you can see that. Yeah. So it's temperature switch, but let's go through the whole name. How many poles and how many throws? Anyone? Single pole. Single pole, single throw, right? It's only got one pole on it and it only and it only connects in one direction if there was another little dot up here and if it opened it would connect to that dot then we would have a single pole double throw but this is single pole single throw most safeties are right in this particular case if it gets too hot it opens which means that and again it's shown as normally closed so it's shown as closed so that would be a single pole single throw normally closed open on rise thermal switch all that is just built right into this little picture and it makes perfect sense right temperature rises it's going to shut off what's it going to shut off this little guy right here what's this little guy crankcase heater crankcase heater right so if your crankcase heater control says hey compressor's hot enough it's going to open up i'm going to shut off your crankcase heater makes perfect sense right all, a lot of this stuff is really logical all right let's take a look at a contact contacts are easy they just look like this difference between contact and a switch. And again, this isn't necessarily universal, but generally speaking, a contact is usually activated um, in a relay contactor um, starter by an electromagnetic coil, meaning it's activated by another um, sort of pilot duty coil. And as we know, on a contactor, we've got that electromagnetic coil on the bottom. This is a air conditioner. So that's a 24 volt coil, residential single phase air conditioner. When that, 20, when that 24 volt coil is energized, uh, the circuit is made on the uh, on the Y circuit, goes back to common on the other side, then it's going to close this switch. A closed switch, a normally closed switch looks like this. Your switch on your start relay, your potential relay is a normally closed switch. It means if it's just sitting there all by itself, ain't nothing happening, it's closed. Compressor contactor, if it's just sitting there all by itself, power's all off, 
That switch is going to be open. Normally open, normally closed. Right? Pretty simple. You're also going to see little circles like this. Whenever you see a little circle like this, that's generally going to be a relay coil. Sometimes they can also draw them as a squiggly line, but especially on modern diagrams, you're going to see them generally just being a circle. So this is your start relay coil, and this is your start relay switch, right? So when this start relay coil has a high enough back EMF, a high enough potential across it, then it opens up the start relay switch and it takes out the start capacitor out of the circuit. That's how a start capacitor works. It starts out with the start capacitor in the circuit. Once that motor starts producing enough back EMF, because your motor is a generator as well as a motor, it will end up creating enough potential, enough voltage that it opens up or it energizes this uh, relay coil and it opens up the, um, the relay switch that's normally closed and it takes out the start capacitor so it doesn't burn out the compressor. But again, in terms of symbols, knowing these symbols is really, really helpful. And again, just a few basic ones. Coil, normally closed switch or normally closed contact. Normally open contact. What about this one right here? What is this symbol where you have a straight line and then you have a curvy line? What does that mean? Anybody know? Give me a second to drink my cold coffee. Capacitor. Capacitor, yeah. Yeah, so you can see SC, start capacitor. One straight line, one curved line. That means a capacitor. And you'll see same thing here, right? This is our RC, our run capacitor. Straight line, curved line. This is our compressor side of the dual cap. This is our fan side of the dual cap, <clears throat> right? All right, so we've talked about pressure activated switches. It's normally closed, open on fall, normally closed, open on rise, right? Some of you may not get that, but imagine if you push on this, it's already closed. So in order for this, something to change on this switch, pressure has to drop and that would open it. In this case, the pressure has to increase and then that would open it. So the part that stays put is always on the left side and the switch opens and closes on the right side, if that makes sense. All right, I'm gonna zoom out here a little bit. We're gonna look here at this little circuit. This is something that one of the uh, commenters was talking about earlier. Easy heat and cooling was mentioned in this, that there are a lot of series switch circuits or switches in series. Um, the for safety. So we have an LPC, we have an HGS, we have an HPC, right? Low pressure control, hot gas switch, high pressure control. And then we have this time delay circuit. So this is a new one that you haven't seen before. But this little arrow guy is a time delay circuit. We have our compressor contactor coil, same thing. And this is our Y circuit. So if any of these normally closed switches were to open, Again, this one right here, high pressure control, single pole, single throw, or normally closed, single pole, single throw, open on rise pressure switch. That little bell tells me it's a pressure switch. I can tell it's open on rise because it's closed. And if I push on it, then this side here would rise. So that would open the circuit. This is a um, uh, single pole, single throw, thermal, um, open on fall, uh, thermal switch. Single pole, single throw, open on fall, pressure switch. Normally closed. All of them are all normally closed. All right. Any questions? So you're going to notice that in terms of symbols, we got a lot more symbols on this side. So we got some information that we get over here that we don't get over here, right? We don't have all this cool information about the switches and what causes them to open and close on this side. But on this side, we don't have colors of wires. We don't know exactly where they're connected. So you're going to have to kind of jump back and forth. I prefer to start over here on the ladder side just to get a sense of the circuits. And then once I'm tracing an individual circuit, so I, I've already kind of got a sense of where I want to go, then I move over here to my point-to-point -point or connection diagram. Or in this case, they're just calling it a wiring diagram. Cool stuff. I think I pretty much beat that dead horse. I don't know if there's anything else I want to cover there. Uh, any 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 questions anybody wants to cover before we move on to the next one? All right. So this is a, well, actually, before I tell you, let's see if somebody can tell me what type of equipment this is. First, uh, 
first person to tell me gets a gets to pet one of Nathan's goats. What type of equipment is this? I'm just going to let you hang until somebody answers, either on uh, either on YouTube or The Apprentices. Air handler? Uh, close, close. Not quite, though. Not quite. You'll find some things that give it away. Now, I, I understand what you said, air handler, because we got a blower there, but there's some things here that give it away, especially if you look over here at the legend. I know it's probably kind of hard to see. A furnace. A furnace. A furnace. Absolutely. Took a while, but you got there. So a few things that tell us it's a furnace. One of the first, one of the first that I that I notice is that it has HSI. HSI. Let's see what that see what that stands for. Hot surface igniter. So obviously to have a hot surface igniter, you're gonna have a furnace. It also talks about um, gas valves and all that kind of stuff. So what I like about gas furnaces is they have some Mac Daddy uh, safety circuits in them, where there's just a whole bunch of switches wired in series. Back to that whole switches wired in series. But let's follow, before we get into it, let's just follow uh, the same process that we followed last time. So let's identify some of the things that are not always going to be there. So what are some things that are going to be optional here? Let's see if you can, see if you can find any of them. What are some of the what are some of the options on this? It's not as many, not nearly as many optional items here, but there are some. Right, see up here? We got we got dashes. So, and you see it says when used here. When used on LS2. So what is LS2? LS1 and 2, limit switch auto reset. So that means that there may not be an LS2. There may only be an LS1. There may only be one limit switch. And that's most likely, and this is something that you're also going to see a lot, where a lot of these diagrams, it's not just for factory options. It's also for a wide range of sizes. So you may have one diagram that is for the entire uh, you know, category of furnaces. So this would be, uh, let's see if I can fit out. Oh. Hold on. This is the uh, 58 uh, PHB carrier furnace. But it doesn't say what size. And so you may have one of the smaller ones that only has one and maybe one of the larger furnace models that has more than one. So you pay attention to that. Also be helpful to go ahead and read note number 10 if you're up here and you're confused about this. Let's go to note 10 and see what it says. Factory connected when BVSS chimney adapter accessory kit is not installed. So when you don't have this accessory kit, then that's going to be factory connected. Over here, we've got a, I saw another note up in this area. Oh, here. So these say when used LGPS. So what is our LGPS? Low gas pressure switch. All right, what's that all about? Let's go to note uh, number 11. Factory connected when LGPS is not used. So uh, and, and, and my understanding is that the L LGPS is generally going to be used on this when you do a, uh, an adapter, or sorry, an adapter, a conversion to LP. Because in LP, you can have this drop in gas pressure as your tank goes uh, empty, and you'd want to you'd know that. So sometimes you're going to have that, sometimes you're not going to have that. And again, what are you looking for? You're looking for these dashy lines, right? You're looking for these notes, things to, things to pay attention to. Once again, we've got information over here that we don't have over there. So red spare one, orange spare two, et cetera. Look over here, same thing, blower, it's a blower motor. They both have the same note, but here it doesn't tell you the colors, right? It's giving you the circuits, but it's not giving you the colors. Over here on this diagram, it actually is giving you some of the safety switch information that we didn't have on that previous one, right? Over on that previous one, when it had these switches, it just showed like a little well, actually, I'll show you what I'm talking about here. So these are switches, but they don't show them as switches. They just show them as little bars. On this carrier one, they do show them as switches. So you have that information about what type of switch they are. But here's this interesting thing. On this uh, on this point to point, we can kind of trace this out. And this is actually a really 
common thing you do want to pay attention to. What can cause this furnace not to run? Well, there's a lot of things, but you see this whole battery of safeties that are all connected one in and out of the other, right? And you've got a red wire going in and you got a red wire coming out. So we would start here and we could actually trace and see, all right, do I have voltage here, 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 here? Oop, I don't have it here. Or I, or, I ha or I don't have it here, I should say. Okay, well, it was all good. Then LS1, I stopped having voltage. That's my limit switch. Okay, that's where I need to focus. And you can see these are all normally closed switches. You're also going to notice that all of these are normally closed switches. <coughs> and they're all the same type of normally closed switch. They're all identical. Who wants to tell me what type of normally closed switch these are? Come on, I'm waiting. Single pull, single throw, uh, open on rise, thermal. Exactly, nailed it. I can always count on Jessica. Yep, and, and why is that? Well, it's because it's a furnace, right? And so you want things to shut off when things get too hot, right? <laughs> so pretty obvious. You got a lot of different types that perform different functions, but they're all doing basically the same thing. If it's getting too hot, it's shutting the furnace off. Pretty straightforward. Now we have here, kind of interesting, right? This is a, and it is it is actually kind of funny here because this is connected in the opposite direction. I mean, this, this isn't the standard that you'd see. It's actually connected on this side, but you can see this is a normally open switch. I actually find a lot of things in, in diagrams and schematics that are kind of funny, um, but you can see these are normally open switches. And these are pressure switches. We already talked about what a transformer looks like. This is, you know, your traditional transformer. We have our primary connecting in here, white and black. Going to our white is going over here to this plug, it looks like. It's kind of hard to see. And that's the kind of the issue with a lot of these diagrams is you, it's kind of hard to tell. Yep, it's going over to this plug. And that is energizing our transformer and then black. It's going here to our PR1, our primary one. But if we look over here, let's try to find the same thing. See if we can find on our schematic the same, um, same transformer. And actually, I'm having a hard time locating it here. So let's see. We got L1 and L2, right? But let's see if we can find our transformer. Oh, here it is right here. So we've got 115 volts here. And now this all is our low voltage side. This is all of our high voltage side. This is all our low voltage side. And that's going to be very typical. Now, again, for an old school ladder schematic, this would all be in the center. You'd have two lines running down either side, and it would be much more clean. Nowadays, even with your ladder schematics, they're not as much ladder as they used to be. I mean, it's still a schematic, but you don't have as much of L1 on one side, L2 on the other side, you know, you're on your secondary 24 volts on either side. They're, they're kind of more of a composite of a connection diagram and a, and a schematic diagram, which for an old timer like me drives me nuts. You know, it was fine the way it used to be. I don't know what I was got to change everything. Kids today, engineers, lame engineers for everything. All right. Um, so that's, that's the safety circuit. Now let's go through and actually see if we can identify some things. So we're gonna we're gonna scroll to our next. Hold on. All right. So let's pick out some stuff on this furnace and see if we can actually identify it. Now I didn't, you know, I I could have given more complete pictures here, which may have made it a little bit easier. But let's let's try to find something. So first thing, let's try to find a fuse. We got our fuse here, and we've got SEC two and SEC one connecting right under it. So let's see if we can find that on our diagram. Let's start over here. SEC2, SEC1, and then we have our fuse. So you can see, for me at least, that was a little easier to find over here because the transformer is right here. Now, if I go over here and I'm trying to find it, all right, there's SEC1, SEC2, but where's the fuse? Oh, well, there it is but it's not even shown in the circuit, right? 
FU1, Fuse. That's not very nice for, for it to say FU like that. Very rude. A three amp automotive, automotive blade type factory installed fuse. All right, we got a note here. Let's see what that note is. I think it's, I think that's note number six, looks like. Replace only with a three amp fuse. Okay, well, I mean, that's so there's some additional information over there, but for me at least, it was easier to start at the transformer, SEC1, SEC2, and find my fuse right here. All right. Let's see. Let's see what else we can find. We're not going to do all of this, but I'm just giving examples of things that, that you would do. Um, I wish I had a better picture of this, but let's see if we can find this, this ribbon plug. Now, so when you're trying to identify something like a, like a plug or a connector, it's usually going to be easier to find on the connection diagram or your point-to-point -point diagram. And the reason is, is that all these wires on your schematic, your, your ladder schematic could be all over the place. Because your ladder schematic doesn't care where it, you know, whether things are close to each other in real life. But on your point to point, it should be easier. So let's see if we can find it. Where is that ribbon cable or that, that connector? It's not really a ribbon cable, but that connector on this diagram over here. Let's go back again. You're going to notice we've got a blue on top and then a red and red and all that. Looks like we got a white here down on the bottom, I think. Right here, right? That's, and, and you can kind of identify it because they sort of put it in proximity on the PCB. Anybody know what PCB is? Anybody? Printed circuit board. Printed circuit Analogs. board. There you go. Okay. You did it. And it says it right here too. Analogs. What? Yeah, anyway. I was going to say Panama City Beach. Panama City Beach. Yes, also. Very, very, very good. Very good, which is a lot of people believe is in Florida, but actually it is in Southern Alabama. We do not claim the panhandle as actually Florida because they be cray cray up in there. Hope there. Hopefully there's no panhandle people listening. All right, printed circuit board. That's right. And so everything here, and this is actually another interesting thing that you're going to see on a lot of connection diagrams. And so this kind of bounds the printed circuit board. And so things are going to be laid out here on this board the way they kind of are in real life. So we've got this connector, and these are going to be numbered. I don't have a great picture here of the numbers, but these are going to be numbered. In fact, it says right here, PL1. Let's see if it says PL1. Sure enough, there it is. PL1. Plug one. All right. Now let's see if we can find this right here. Our motor speed taps. Let's see if we can find those. Oh, there they are. Pretty easy. 24 volt motor taps right there because everything is kind of drawn in proximity. So it's much easier to identify what's on here on which one of these diagrams? Which one of these diagrams is it easier to find things in real life where they're located? Connection diagram, right? Schematic, finding these same things. Now, we can do something like, all right, so we know this is PL1, so we can try to find PL1 over here, but I don't know that we're... I mean, so, yeah, here's PL1, but I mean, it's not... Everything's kind of all over the place, right? PL1-1, PL1-9, PL1-11. Each connection is completely separate on a ladder on a ladder schematic. Let's do a little more here. What about our field connections? What are we looking for in order to find field connections on one of these diagrams based on what we've talked about? I'm waiting. One of you. What are we looking for? Field connections. What? Dash line. Dash line. That's right. We're looking for a dash line. So let's see if we can find some dashed lines that are going to work for this. Hmm. 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 I kind of, I kind of misspoke there because here they're not actually showing your field wires coming into these. Wire nuts. Wire nuts, yeah, you could be looking for wire nuts. But here it's not actually even showing them. It's not showing your wires coming in. Now, as far as our high voltage coming in, these right here, or this, you know, it comes into this box, we can probably find that with a dashed line. Let's see. White, black, ground. Those are our dashed lines, right? 
coming into our JB. What is our JB junction box? What does it say here on note number two? Because it applies to our high voltage. Let's see what it says. Use only copper wire between the disconnect switch and the furnace junction box. Okay, so no aluminum. No aluminum for you. We got a fuse. FU number two. Uh, I got more than one FU in here. Again, not very nice. All right. What else? Anything, anything else we should find? Let's see if we can find this, this guy right here. Anybody know what this is called? Inducer fan motor. Our inducer fan. Yeah. Yeah. See if we can find that. Well, first off, IDM, what does that stand for? Let's see if it induced draft motor. Interesting. So they don't always call it an inducer. It's like kind of a Florida thing, calling it an inducer fan, I guess, but induced draft motor. So there it is, black and white. You can see that uh, this goes to our PL2 plug. Now, let's see if we can find the same thing over here. There we go, IDM. This side goes to L2. And this goes to L1 through PL2 and this IDR. So what is our IDR? Induced draft motor relay. So if I had an issue with my induced draft motor, that's the areas that I would look. Induced draft motor relay. That's the path that it has to take for that to run. Now, obviously, knowing your sequence of operation on a furnace, it's going to tell you what other things you should check. But in terms of checking or, or looking at a schematic or a uh, diagram, these are the sorts of things you want to you be able to, to follow. Um, Joe says, where are you going? I don't know what that means, Joe. You know, I appreciate that. What's on the bottom right is what Joe just said. I guess he said that a while ago. Bottom right as in right here. I invited you to actually join us, Joe, and then you could then you could actually ask your questions. But you know, you, no respect. All right, uh, Eric Melly gave me this one um, because this one actually has uh, some interesting um, some interesting features to it. And uh, and let me see if I can figure it out because I actually haven't spent much time looking at it yet. But it has a time delay relay here. It's got some interesting stuff here. Got a contact here. Let's see if we can see if we can spot what's going on here. First, let's see if we can identify all the components. We're gonna I'm gonna follow my own process because he just sent it to me and said, "Hey, there's some there's some interesting interesting things here." So let's see if we can see if we can figure out what he's talking about. All right. So our legend. This is looks to be an actual as built. Um, so it's going to be much more specific. It's specific to a unit serial, which is gives me an indication that it is an as-built. So this isn't a generic uh, diagram. One thing we know, three phase, we can see that because we have three lines of power coming in, or three dashed lines. Compressor, pretty straightforward going in. FM1, that's our fan motor. Fan motor number one, we got a crankcase heater. Let's see. So what he's what he's wanting to focus on, because this side here is really simple. He's wanting to focus on what's going on here. Contactor, SS1. What is SS1? Let's see if we can find that. Where is SS1? Where are you? Well, I said it was going to be all be there, and then I'm not seeing it. Time delay relay one. All right, let's 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 zoom in on this bad boy here. Time delay relay number one. So we can actually set our number of minutes here. Let's see what this. Let's see how this time delay relay is working. All right, so TDR1, C1. Let me, let me look at let me look at Eric's notes real quick. <laughs> Joe Sear says burn. I don't really know. I don't really know what that uh, what that reference is for. Oh, I just lost Jessica. 
All right, let's see what let's see what Eric's notes are real quick. I should probably have had that pulled up before. Even I thought he was going to be here, so I thought he was going to be able to describe what he was wanting to show us here. Give me one second. All right, so here's what he says. Somewhat interesting schematic on this refrigeration condenser it uses a timer to create a holding circuit to bypass the low pressure control for the duration of the timer. Okay, interesting. So the timer bypasses our low pressure control um, so that it doesn't go out initially. Um, let's see here. All right. Okay. Yeah. So here we go. Yep. So time delay relay. All right. Yeah. Very actually quite simple here now that I'm seeing it. So this is our compressor. We have this time delay relay so that if the time delay relay is energized, it still has to go through. What is this? DLT discharge line thermostat high pressure switch, but it bypasses specifically the low pressure switch. And I'm guessing on this particular unit, let's see here. Time delay relay set at one minute. So it bypasses your low pressure switch for one minute. And I'm assuming that's for pump down. Kind of making a fool of myself here, but that's all right. I respect that. Anyway. But this is what that looks like in real life. I don't really like how this capacitor is mounted. You know, that that immediately jumps to mind here. But it's actually a very simple, very simple system. So this is, oh, was somebody going to say something? All right. So, Corey, was that you? Yeah, I was going to say the capacitor needs to be in the box. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if it's not if it's not in the, if it's not in the cardboard box, then uh, then somebody's doing something wrong, right? Anyway, um, so that's that's the purpose of that, and uh, and Eric was just wanting to show that for because it is kind of a unique a unique diagram. But same thing, you know, you can go through each each item on the legend um, to better understand it. If you saw that time delay relay and you didn't know what it was for. Um, then you could, you know, pretty quickly get a get a sense of what it is by just taking a look at the fact that it does bypass our low pressure switch. All right. Um, when you get into more complicated systems, this is just a uh, a really small segment of a uh, carrier humidizer uh, system. Uh, the, uh, part of their diagram. Oh, hey, there's Chad's kid. Very cute. Um, it starts to get more and more complicated where you're just going to be following individual circuits. Um, but you, you kind of have to have a, a, you know, a pretty good sense of what the equipment does in the first place. And really your best place to start is your um, installation and service manual. So spending a little time going through that before you get into uh, some of this is going to, is going to pay off because uh, again, um, you have varying levels of, of detail um, on these. And if you're not focusing in on a particular area, you're going to just see this gigantic diagram again, like this is probably one fifth of the overall diagram. And it's just going to, it's not going to mean anything to you. And I see a lot of text doing this. I wanted to kind of, um, kind of end here. I see a lot of text uh, getting overly fixated on these, you know, highly complicated diagrams. And they're just kind of going all over the place, tracing things until you know what it is that you're looking for. Um, it's kind of a waste of time. So I don't actually like uh, on tech starting with the super complicated and sitting there just beating their head up against a wall. Um, I would like you to focus on, if, if you're new to schematics and diagrams, focus on more simple equipment where you already know the components, you already know the basic sequence of operation, and then you go into your schematics and diagrams. If you don't know those things, it is um, significantly more difficult. And if you're really good with schematics and, and diagrams, you can you know figure some of that stuff out. 
um, but it's generally not not where you want to start. I mean, for example, if we go back to the furnace, if you don't know a uh, typical furnace sequence of operation, um, a lot of this isn't going to make sense, and you're going to you're going to be tracing out circuits all day. But if you don't know what should happen first, what should happen next, uh, then you know it, it's just you're going to be wasting a lot of your time. So some knowledge of you know all the components, what they look like, where they are, then you can find them on here. Um, you know, go through your legend, go through your notes, uh, and then it's going to make a lot more sense. And again, the best way to learn how to read diagrams and schematics is to read more diagrams and schematics on systems that you're already fairly fairly familiar with. Um, that's that's kind of the the point that I want to make here. And so that means that to those of you who tell me, you know, like, look, I want to learn more. Um, uh, I want to learn more about reading schematics. And I'm super uncomfortable. Well, just go to a, a typical straight cool condenser if you work on a lot of AC or a heat pump, if you work on a lot of heat pumps or a fan coil or a furnace. And if you're already comfortable with those systems, you know where the components are, then the, then the diagrams and schematics are going to make a lot more sense. And then when you end up somewhere like this on a piece of equipment you don't work on normally, um, then at least you're going to be able to kind of, you know, fumble your way around. Because as you can see, you know, this is technically a ladder schematic, but even then, you know, it's not connecting from L1 to L2. You've got these two separate segments here. They're not really connecting together. You don't have it going from one side to the other. You know, your lines are coming in sideways. And so every manufacturer is a little different. And uh, and it is getting, in, at least from, from my standpoint, it's getting more and more frustrating because of how much variation there is and how manufacturers do their schematics and diagrams. But if you know the basics of the equipment first, then you're going to be able to, to make sense of it. Um, and really, if you're, if you're completely lost, start with your notes, start with your legend, uh, and then you can usually start to figure some things out. So I think we're going to, uh, uh, yeah, performance HVCR says, uh, play around with scrap units, unplug everything and wire it back up. That's actually a really good way. Um, very good point. If you take, <clears throat> take a scrap unit, disconnect everything, start with the schematic and then rewire it from scratch. That's a really great way. Another really nice thing to do is to do your own as built. So take a piece of equipment and draw your own uh, ladder schematic. And you're going to want it to be a basic unit. Um, I would not suggest trying to draw point to points because that's more about art than it is um, than it is about drawing a proper schematic. But, you know, actually, you know, start with your L1 and L2 and draw all your circuits going in between. Um, that's a really good exercise to get better at schematics. And, and frankly, it's the type of thing that it's going to be hard for you because a lot of people will, you know, and uh, in, in part of a school program or whatever, I want to learn how to do it. It just takes a lot of reps. And with the amount of variation of equipment that we see um, and, and the differences in how different manufacturers do it, like we've illustrated here and some of the things that they show or don't show or list or don't list, um, it's just going to take you doing it uh, quite a bit. And then you will get more and more comfortable with it. But, the, you know, again, the only barrier is time. You know, as you get when you start, it's going to take you a lot longer. Uh, as you get better at it, it's going to get faster and faster. Um. Yeah, there's some people have mentioned if if you are wanting more uh, education, I've got some videos uh, specifically on this uh, that do like a carrier heat pump. Um, and again, like the way I teach this is literally what I just did. I just go through it and um, and talk about it component by component. Um, I was hoping again to have a few more people here today um, so that we could you know talk through some of their experiences. But you know, again, I do these all last minute, so you can't always it's you know busy middle of summer, so. Um, but again, it depends on what, depends on what segment of the industry you're in, what you're going to see regularly. Uh, but whatever you work on most is where you should start with schematics and, and, uh, and diagrams always start with whatever you're going to see most, um, rather than the more exotic stuff, because if you're really solid with the basics, then the exotic stuff is going to come easier. If you wait to get into schematics and diagrams until you get to the exotic, then it's going to be overwhelming and almost pointless, almost pointless. Um, all right, cool. So I think that is it for us. So we're going to end a little, well, actually quite a bit early today, um, uh, cause that's all I had prepared for tonight. Any questions from the students or anyone online? We'll give it a couple more minutes. If anybody has any questions or anything else we should review. All right. So you're going to get an extra 45 minutes back students. Um, I appreciate all of you. Thanks for watching, and we will, uh, I, I intend on doing this again every Tuesday and Thursday that I can because it's summer, 
sometimes things come up even even in our business uh, and can't do it. Um, but stay tuned Tuesdays and Thursdays between uh, six and eight. That's when we're generally going to do these. Uh, we're actually going to start starting next Thursday. And uh, we're going to start doing live classes uh, at the Kalos offices. Um, those won't necessarily be shown live. We're going to produce those videos. Um, but we're going to be doing uh, actual hands-on working on equipment and that sort of thing. And a lot of it's going to be focused on electrical diagnosis because that is our highest, highest demand. So, all right. Thank you all so much. And uh, we'll see you on the next one.